We will now have a brief conversation on the stage. There are four chairs here, one for each of the keynote speakers. So can you please join me on the stage? Yeah, that's good. You make sure that's not the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> we are in the spirit of sharing here. So there are two handheld microphones that you share between you. Uh, Amina Mohammed, you gave us a very moving speech. Thank you so much. And we can hear the audience here applauding when Minister Brende talked about the elimination of extreme poverty by 2030. Do you think it's a realistic goal? And do you think there is enough political will to fulfill it? OK, um, absolutely. Um, I think where there's a will, there's a way. And I think that uh, gradually we're seeing a much more political commitment being built just because people are beginning to look at the implications of it. I think we're moving past the rhetoric. Um, there's a lot of commitment to, uh, political commitment to the things that we said. Um, but when we've now started to speak about the how um, mm -hmm. and really looking at the scale at which we want to go to and the commitments that we need, the implications of it are being unpacked in many conversations around the world. And so I do think that people are beginning to think through to the reality of making that happen. I think also that we're finding stronger um, governments within our developing countries who have got plans that didn't have them 12, 15 years ago. Uh, these are plans that were uh, driven by consultants and, and uh, prerequisites for, for financing. And I think now that many have visions of their own, um, and you see, for instance, the African Union talking about um, the eradication and not the reduction of poverty, uh, or, or, or otherwise. So yes, I do think that there is a commitment. So what about the two others? Are you also strong believers in that that goal will be achieved? I think it can be achieved. Whether it will be achieved depends on a few things. One, uh, if I could come back to what Tim was talking about and others, too often we look on investing in education and health, et cetera, uh, as almost an act of charity, which is a derivative of growth and ending poverty. And we need to look much more at how investing in it will create the end uh, of extreme poverty uh, because, and you would expect this, of course, from UNICEF, but the next generation that will decide uh, whether or not we are at that goal are today's children. And if they're not equipped to have the skills to lead uh, this, then it's not going to happen. And if I could make one very short final point, this begins at the very beginning. If a child uh, who is about to be born uh, or within the first thousand days does not get the proper nutrition, does not get the stimulation of hearing parents uh, speak about interesting things, even if the child doesn't quite understand them, if the child is the victim of violence or abuse, that child's brain does not develop, uh, literally does not develop, and for the rest of that child's life, that child will not contribute to the elimination uh, of poverty. Uh, so we have to start very, very early. Evans, you believe it too? Yeah, I, I, believe, I, I believe that by setting an ambitious target, we'll get much closer than we would if we didn't set that target. Uh, secondly, I think, uh, and I would agree with Tony, that we need to look at it as a comprehensive effort across all development sectors, and that's why I particularly mention the need for us in health to move beyond regressive and equitable financing to prepayment systems, because we know that 100 million people are impoverished annually because of paying for health care as you go, right? And so the health sector has an important role to contribute uh, just on that front, let alone the opportunities for people to pursue education and employment uh, not constrained uh, by illness. And the last thing, I would come back to Tony's point, which in his speech, um, if we don't achieve it, um, it's the right uh, uh, goal to fail on because it is the right goal. Mm -hmm. 
Let's follow up on that. Uh, can you pass the microphone to the, the foreign minister? Um, we have seen tremendous results in the health field. Are there experiences in that field that you think can be applied to education, like combining the private sector, uh, philanthropes, uh, and uh, governments, and, uh, and multilateral organizations? Yes, that's the short answer to that. <laughs> I, I think it was uh, also um, underlined uh, here that there are lessons learned uh, from the scaling up on, on health that uh, can uh, have uh, can be uh, at inspiration for what we need to do on education. But those two is. So, what is the most important factor? Let, let me <laughs> say that those things are also very strongly interlinked. It was uh, said by Mr. Lake, used uh, the illustration of sanitation. Uh, for example, if you have no uh, adequate sanitation facilities at the schools, you will not have uh, girls attending the schools. You also need uh, to have a health situation that makes uh, the children able to go to school. We know, for example, with the HIV AIDS epidemic that we have seen in Africa unfolding for many years that there are children-headed families where children have to take the lead in the family because their parents have passed away because of the epidemic and there are not even grandparents there. How can they manage, for example, to, uh, to go to school? But I would like uh, to turn, uh, come back to the um, to the broader issue of the MDGs and our, I, I would say that uh, what we can uh, take as a conclusion here is that they are achievable, also uh, very ambitious uh, goals for uh, 2030, but I think we also have to learn from the MDGs that we agreed on in 2000 in the sense that they have to be universal, they also have to be much more comprehensive but without uh, missing and losing the edge. But I think we have seen that we cannot only look at very clear targets without also bringing in uh, the sustainability in this. We know that if we can't deal with issues related to the environment and climate change, it will be much harder to reach uh, the poverty uh, goals uh, moving forward. And there, I think Amina has started a very, very comprehensive way of looking at it. I would, though, say that I have one concern, and that is that so far the Secretary General has, I think this is because of a call from different countries, to make this into an intergovernmental process. That can create a lot of more ownership, but looking at the challenges we have had on Doha Development Road, uh, round and also on climate change, it can also very easily head into an impasse. So what we need to make sure is that there's ownership, universality, but not making it into an intergovernmental impasse. That would be just a catastrophe. Mm -hmm. I mean, a moment, would you like to comment on that? Um, okay, I, I, think, um, I think the reality is that member states have decided that this is what they want to do and they're going to do it and they're going to be responsible for a set of goals at the end of it. I think the good thing about it is that it is open and transparent and that we have opportunities to inform that. And, and the way and manner in which we've conducted some of these, uh, uh, engaged with some of the opportunities to inform it has been, has been great. I think what we do need more of and that we're not hearing enough of, and perhaps that's because uh, we, we're partnering better, um, so we need to find a way to partner better and have a louder voice, is civil society. Um, civil society, young people need to get engaged in a way in which we ignite a movement that gives a balance to really pushing the ambition. I think my concern over an intergovernmental process is not that we won't get a set of goals or a financing framework, is the ambition of them to, to respond to the complexities and the demands that our world have today. Uh, so I would say that we need to hear much more and, and fi find a focused and, um, I think, a, a better way of engaging with this um, whole. It's been difficult because we do want to finish the MDGs and there has been that sort of balancing act. When do you start to put pressure and build the momentum and ambition for post-2015 without losing uh, the impetus on finishing off um, what we started? Because that is a promise we've made to millions of people. Uh, one person matters, and so when we talk about millions and people sort of don't quite 
come to, to terms with that, the one person that matters. And I think we have to build that. We, we have to finish the MDGs, that is the credibility and um, the integrity which we go forward on the post-2015, but more partners um, and, and perhaps more pressure uh, being brought from country level uh, to our member states. I think the expectations are very high, um, and I think that they're beginning to feel that, and, and that's what we need to keep to keep the ambition. Like, will you comment? I, I think Are you concerned too? Uh, yes, and I, I think there's a lot to learn in the education field from what's happened in health. Uh, because frankly, I, I think we all share a passion here for education, but we need to challenge ourselves also uh, using health as an example. The MDGs, it's, if you look back on it, the MDG measurements are about process, getting kids into school. The health MDGs were almost completely about results. Uh, and we need to do that for education now going forward. Secondly, we're much better uh, in the health field at measuring those results than we are at measuring education outcomes. And the Learning uh, Metrics Task Force uh, that many of us are involved on are studying how do you measure learning, uh, because that still is very controversial. We have a lot of work to do on that. Third, I think we have to certainly get the intergovernmental processes going, but we also have to challenge governments to put up more uh, in the way of their own resources, you mentioned taxes and other ways, uh, to support education in their own countries. And one way to do that is to not only focus on governments, but to focus much more, as again we have in health, for example, on the movements around HIV and AIDS, to create more movements and popular pressure within countries for better quality education. Because who cares more about that than parents? And the parents can be mobilized then into these movements that will put that pressure on governments. Thank you, Evans. Just uh, one thing <coughs> that I think that there is a lot to learn, but I, I think one of the areas where there's a common challenge is understanding the public-private mix. Um, this is a very important to health and one where we are, continue to struggle, but I think it's also very important in education insofar as, as Tony said, that parents are, have a, a very, very high propensity to spend on their children's education, but the return on that investment is, I think, uh, not terribly satisfactory. And I think one needs to look uh, and count those investments um, that uh, parents are making with respect to getting more individual tuition for their children, uh, sometimes four or five tutors uh, alongside payments for a regular schooling. Um, that's all part of what I would call inefficient and perhaps inequitable uh, investment. And one needs to think, uh, uh, I think much more systematically about how one can channel those resources to improve quality and standards as well as access uh, so that it isn't just education for those that have the means, but it's education for all. Yes, Ben Blanda, please. Just a short reflection on following up on something Mr. Lake said in his speech about this with education, education, and education, and uh, you used the uh, illustration of uh, Korea. And we know that one of uh, President Obama's favorite stories is when his father left uh, Kenya in the end of the 50s, early 60s, the GDP per capita in Kenya and uh, South uh, Korea was the same. And today, the GDP per capita is at least 20 times higher in Korea. And I think there is a clear interlinkage between what they did on the educational field, but it's also, of course, a combination of a lot of other policies for increasing competitiveness. So I think education is also, and this we have to uh, remind ourselves, is a core responsibility as health is also for a nation state. So this uh, new MDGs in this area cannot be a compensation so you can use more, for example, for military expenditures because the donor countries come in and, and cover what you're doing uh, on education. So this is a tricky balance. I would also say that under the very, very able leadership of my friend Amina, I'm sure that we're gonna have a successful result when it comes uh, to new MDGs, but it is, going to be a bit more tricky because last time it was kind of a coup d'etat of the Secretary General. It was just put <laughs> forward at, uh, and it was the best, the only coup d'etat I ever supported <laughs> in my life and I ever will support. It was put forward to the General Assembly and he just used the gavel and then uh, they were there. Uh, so, but I think this time is going to be a bit more complicated, but I hope there will be ambitious enough so we can reach 
what we just talked about, eradicating all extreme poverty. But then it no needs to take also a lot of other elements because the MDG has been fantastic, but looking back at them, of course, they were not totally comprehensive. Uh, maybe that was the strength, but they didn't always make sense on all the details. This time it's going to be a different kind uh, of uh, process, and you can count on Norway's uh, support uh, in this work. Mm. Let's turn to child and maternal mortality. Most of it uh, occurs in middle-income countries. And Amina Mohammed, how can the international community contribute to maternal health, education, and poverty challenges? in middle-income countries. Uh, thank you. I think a, a lot of this has got to do with what countries do with their own domestic resources and how they target them better to building better systems, human resource capacity. And I think once you map the mix that needs to be supported in country, then I think that the international community can come um, with what it could leverage to, to move the needle in the right direction. I think often countries are fraught with um, competing demands for these resources. Uh, hopefully, there is a better understanding now that beyond MDG 4 and 5, which I think sort of opened up the whole, um, the whole challenge of what you need to do, not just to invest in maternal and child care, but what you need to do to sustain it, um, now we can begin to see a better uh, partnership of, of moving uh, different resources, different emphasis on um, how to support systems to carry, to carry this. Um, I think that in, in education, the, uh, the burden of expenditure on, on, a, on a regular, recurrent basis is huge. Um, and I think the commitments that we've made in the past have not really taken into consideration the opportunities we have for technology now to reduce these costs and to get further and, and wider and deeper on a lot of things. I think we need less, um, much more homegrown uh, priority setting of, of what it is that an education and a health system needs to do to respond in country. Um, if I look at some of the curriculum that we had to attend with in our country, uh, just for primary education, we had 13 subjects. This was absolutely ridiculous, but it was one advice to another. So I think we need more coherence um, in, in the way in which um, the donor community supports countries and gets, really tries to get behind improving the quality of a plan, the impact of it, um, and better helping a system respond in terms of the competing demands and the resources it has. That was the Christmas tree you were talking about. Yes, the Christmas tree will always be there because everyone has got a priority. But I think that ultimately if we look to see what is it, what, what are the objectives, what are the end that we want to, to achieve, um, and look at the time frame we have for this development agenda. I often say that what we bring into the development agenda in conversations today is going to be 20, 30 years down the road. Um, and I think that we need to be very clear about what can we do on this one. I'll give you an example because when we talk about the sustainable development agenda and really opening up the conversation um, to the economy, an inclusive economy and, and much more resources from the business community, improving domestic resource base and the revenue mobilization through better tax systems, um, opening up, we find where the tax havens are now, we need to access them. The kind of legal instruments and the enabling environment you need in country can sometimes take years before that happens. I know the tax systems in my country, before we put in the, the kind of um, regulatory frameworks and legal instruments we needed to collect, um, it took us six years. Mm. Now this is the development agenda that we're talking about post-2015. So there is a transition that we need to accommodate. I think we need to find better ways of doing this faster. I think it is incredibly important that business and parliamentarians are talking about the development agenda because when we hand it to them, um, September 2015, they will have to run with it. And it's going to be pretty, um, I, I think it's now that we have to start talking about how we're going to be fit for that purpose as institutions, as governments, um, to be able to carry this um, to the scale that we need to. Evans? Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I think this observation is a very um, fundamental one that, that many of the constituencies that, that we're concerned with um, are in majority found in middle-income countries, uh, meaning the poor. And, and, and this is sort of the reality of the post-2015 uh, context. And it's inevitable in the sense that many of the low-income countries are now middle-income countries, right? Um, India is a, is a good example, and there's a, a very large number of people that continue to live in poverty in that country. 
But to me, it, it's really the agenda that UNICEF has been promoting, <coughs> and not to steal your thunder, Tony, but to really just endorse what you're, <laughs> you're doing, which is it's, it's really focusing on equity within countries, making sure that there's equal opportunity for all for health and education. And this is a shared challenge. This is a universal challenge. It's not only low-income countries that have this. It's middle-income and also high-income countries. Right? And to me, this is, means it's a natural uh, for the post-2015 agenda, which is we really have to have a very deliberate and explicit focus on how we ensure universal entitlements to health and education in our countries, everywhere. How we do that, I think, is part of the, the, the joint agenda for learning. And there's all sorts of different contextual variables which provide a scale efficiency in global knowledge generation and sharing that can be used so that lessons can be identified across countries which will allow us in different contexts to identify ways in which we might address some of those complex challenges that Amina's identified much more effectively by understanding what our neighbors are doing. Thank you. We will soon have lunch, but before that, I'd like to challenge you, Berke Brenda. We, when all of you have talked about the hardest to get, the fifth child, as you used in, in UNICEF, the 10% children. How to reach those who are hardest to get? What could be done? As I said also in my, in my speech, I think we find those areas in um, conflict areas. We see now, for example, in Syria, there are... T 10 million people that need uh, humanitarian access. There is very difficult with access. We know in Somalia, we know also partly in Sudan, we know in DRC. Uh, we have a lot of examples in those areas where there is conflict and war. It's very hard to reach with health. It's very hard to reach also with education. And we even see that is, there is uh, tough uh, to get the appropriate vaccination done. We know that now, uh, in, uh, for example, in Sudan, there are areas where vaccination has not been possible uh, the last months. I spoke with um, uh, Ambeki uh, the other day, and we looked at how can we make sure that uh, President Bashir and, and the Sudanese uh, government also come up with a plan how to bring in uh, vaccination and health. So we need um, to work even harder on uh, peace and reconciliation. Then we also need to be very aware of those resources that we have available also have to reach the most vulnerable, but also those that are disabled and those that are not in the first line when you're there and coming up with the support because these are done sometimes very traditionally. I think we also have to rely on volunteers in these areas. And I mean, I mentioned civil society. I've seen a tremendous of uh, um, uh, undertakings driven by volunteers and civil society and among the people in uh, areas that are, um, are vulnerable. So I think we, in all this discussion, we need to look at uh, different tools at the same time. I think ODA is one piece, but of course, without uh, peace, uh, it's very difficult. But thirdly, without economic growth, nothing really will happen. And there is also, as uh, Mr. Evans said, there is a new challenge that we're currently facing, that we have countries that are both developed and developing countries. And not, uh, and this, is also raising new uh, challenges and issues also as, as a donor uh, country. But what we have seen and the reason why we've been able to reach the MDGs in halving the amount of uh, people living in extreme poverty is that the last decades we've seen unprecedented economic growth globally and the value of uh, global trade has increased by a factor with, of 20 we have to make sure that the de developing countries also are part of this, that they're not under-globalized, but globalized in the right sense and have access to our markets too. So we're not only focusing on ODA, but we're also making sure that they can develop into being real middle-income countries, and that you can only do if you're also part of the global market economy. Thank you. Yeah, um, before we end this session, I'd like to challenge you, Antena Lake. You are a veteran in this field. 
Uh, Tim Evans talked about the grand convergence that the rich and the middle income and the poor countries can kind of meet in 2035 with the same standard for maternal health. Do you believe in that wish? Oh, Is I it more possible? than believe in it. I think it's achievable. And our modeling shows that it's achievable. Uh, if we uh, do exactly what so many have said here, which is to invest in every country in the areas in greatest need. Uh, what is that? I can't see. I can see zero nine eight seven six. Is that for the whole session or? We are me? about to wrap up now. Okay, yes. then, uh, because I could wave my arms around and speak on this forever. Let me just make. Some you thought very you had fifteen points. hours left? Yes. The, the reason to invest in the most disadvantaged areas is fundamentally in rights, because rights are universal. Every child, wherever that child is born, has the same right uh, to a future. Uh, but beyond that, let me emphasize what I said before, which is that our studies show, and more and more studies show, including the IMF, that when you invest in equity, when you invest in the most disadvantaged areas, you get the biggest return on investment, because the results are bigger. The traditional view has been that it's too expensive, takes too much time to go into those areas, in fact, those additional costs are outweighed by the benefits. How do you do it? Uh, I would simply argue after you decide you want to do it is, first of all, innovation. The cell phone is transforming how we can reach into these communities. Secondly, in every country, uh, industrial country, middle income country, wherever, movements. Because the way now youth especially are interconnected means that you can work with governments, uh, but you're not reaching people the way you can if you're also working through social media uh, and working through creating movements around the world in favor of health and education and in the end, their rights. And if I could conclude by saying no nation around the world has been more of a champion for children's rights than Norway and one last time to say thank you. And let me then say thank you for participating in this uh, conversation. Thank you very much. So you might leave the stage if you like. <laughs>